Hello and welcome back to Universe Sandbox 2 and today we're doing something a little bit different. If you read the title, this is going to get interesting real fast. A lot of you are going to ask the question, why why feed into this? Why feed into the Flat Earthers? And you know what? It's because I want to see how they think. Um, because I actually do want to know their theories because I'm sure they're very interesting. Um, and that's why today we have 10 questions for Flat Earthers and of course in Universe Sandbox 2 because it is a Saturday we had to find a way to wrap that in. So we will be using visuals from Universe Sandbox 2 and such. Um, and so we're going to start out with our first question. So my first question for Flat Earthers is please explain how the global positioning system works. So, currently, well, I hope everyone knows what GPS is. It's basically a system of satellites that are able to give you your position up to an accuracy of 5 meters using originally 24 satellites in orbit around the Earth, which gave complete coverage to being able to access at least three satellites at any time, and I'll be explaining how that works in a second, but now we're up to 31 satellites in orbit, and it uses, well, it's so crazy how accurate it is that it has to use Einstein's special laws of relativity, or laws of special relativity, in order to sync up, because they need to know three things. They need to know the uh, velocity of the satellites in their position compared well yeah the velocity in position of the satellites and the other satellites and they need to know the time how long they have been flying and if they know those things they're able to accurately calculate everything but because time is such a huge factor in it they actually need atomic clocks on these satellites used for this no this is Juno this is the closest we're going to get to the satellites used for GPS in Universe Sandbox 2 that is not an actual uh, GPS satellite, but it'll do for our little test here. And what we're going to do is this obviously isn't going to ping onto Earth, um, though it will at one point. So what we're going to do is we're going to show that how this works. If we have three satellites in orbit, which you need much more than three to cover the entire world, and they'd be much further down. Uh, this is just slightly dramatized for viewing effects. Now, if we do power and we do pulse, we can launch a ringer sphere of particles at a set velocity. That's what we want to do. And we want a sphere of, we're going to do 10,000 particles, and we're going to have them go at the speed of light. So this is an accurate speed. This is the speed at which these signals are going to be moving in real life. And if we hit each of these satellites with this, this is going to be the waves that the or signals that the satellites are constantly sending out to all of the different GPS using devices and it's going to get a little bit laggy just because of the amount of particles but if we speed things up a little bit we'll see that these spheres are going to expand and we can pinpoint accurately a location when what will happen is these spheres at one point there will be an intersection where all three touch. Now there will only be one point where this happens. Well, technically because of the sphere, there will be multiple, but you have to think of this more two-dimensionally when you're thinking about the ground. Um, that, that point would be right about, if I can see properly, here is where all three points connect, and then all three satellites would be able to talk to each other about where they are using time and their velocity, and then they would be able to determine that it's between all three of these satellites, and they could pinpoint it to that spot there. Now, like I said, this would be much further down next to the Earth, so if we quickly move Earth, yes, very realistic simulation we got going on here. If we move Earth so that it's basically touching here, and we have the satellites, so we could have just let it run longer for the signal to go out further. But we can see that it will pinpoint one location on Earth, which at the moment <laughs> is not lined up very well. I'm going to, oh god, the lag, because, because of the amount of particles. So right now we have our one point pretty much above Cuba. 
and this would be how your phone calculates it and this in real life is accurate up to five meters right now we are accurate up to probably a few miles this this area in here is what we've gotten it down to but that point is where all three collide and that's how the global positioning system works so my question for the flat earthers if this isn't how it works if it isn't satellites what does it uh radios yes i know i'm going to see that as an exclamation radio towers but interference is the problem there the amount of interference that would go through from bouncing radio waves through the atmosphere it would five meters is extremely accurate and it's quite a feat that we've accomplished and well i guess i'll let you guys explain how it works then so that that's just my first question for you guys and uh let's go on to the next one so question number two this is going to seem like a simple one to most people but if we get rid of earth here and we're going to add in the sun if the earth is flat i want to know exactly how at least i know i'm not going to get a consistent answer out of this because everyone is going to say different things but i like to have nice uh debate in the chat so i want to hear your theories on how day and night work that's a big one considering <laughs> it's something everyone can experience as the earth rotates we see day and then we see midday as it goes towards the darker end with less sunlight hitting and then night and then it's night for another 12 hours before the sun starts peeking over again which here's our sunrise here and look it's day again but that's going to be my question number two i know that's a simple one that's been asked before but i need to include it here after something as complicated as the global positioning system it, it just seems right not to make everything completely crazy so yeah that is that is question number two for for people also the moon yeah, let's just throw the moon in there too, because things get even more complicated when you consider the moon in its phases. And lunar eclipses, those two, let's add that on, because lunar eclipses, instead of happening every time the moon goes by Earth, because the moon is at an inclined plane, this is a little bit <laughs> uh, more serious than it should be, but because the moon is at an inclined plane, it very rarely actually blocks the sun out from Earth. It's very, very rare that it's actually at the correct spot at the correct time to block light off of Earth, which is why solar eclipses are not very common. If the Earth was, well, flat and it was just the moon passing over every time, that would mean that you would have a solar eclipse every day, would it not? There's that. That's question number two. Yeah, the moon. We all like the moon and lunar phases, but I think that this was a more uh, important question because basically solar eclipses only work because of the way the moon orbits the Earth. So if you cut the orbit out of that, how does that work? You can see our nice moon phases here. We flip around, although the atmosphere isn't simulated in this, so that we we can kind of see everything all day here. Is the moon again okay so let's go question number three Woo! let's go question number three I don't really have much of a visual I guess I'll just demonstrate how gravity works <laughs> how does gravity work now what we know now yeah the thing is even even non flat earthers gravity is complicated but what is currently known about gravity because it's very hard to prove something like gravity which a lot of uh, flat earthers make sure to make that clear that everything is a theory when it comes to these things but there is a good reason for it and it's that for gravity be uh, gravity to be true it would have to work on every single object in the universe and there's no physical way to prove something on everything in the universe uh, we'd have to continually look for actually everything to prove that gravity is a law and not in fact a theory 
So it's, it's pretty much technically at the point of being a law. It's just, you know, the way it's defined, when you say that something has to work for all objects with mass in the universe, it's complicated because you have to be able to prove that it works for all objects with mass in the universe, and that is not an easy thing to prove. But as we add mass to an object in the universe sandbox 2, we can see that it goes from being a crooked and like strangely shaped asteroid into a nice sphere because of the equal pressure on each side or gravitational force on each side of the object, which is somewhat molten, which presses it into a nice sphere shape. So yes, one of my questions here is, how exactly does gravity work on a flat Earth? Because if gravity doesn't pull in all directions equally, and it's just pulling down, doesn't that break a lot of laws of physics? Just a few? And why does it only pull down? There's no other forces that only go in one direction like that. Electromagnetic fields go in all directions, and they make an entire 3D shape that you can see. Why wouldn't gravity make similar waves like that in different directions? And why would it only be pushing down? Does it make sense? Okay, so, uh, qu question number four coming up next. Question number four. How are tides formed? So, general understanding is that tides, actually, I would be wrong if I said tides were only caused by the moon, but the majority of tides are caused by the moon. There are solar tides too caused by the sun, but they're rather unnoticeable when such a large object is close to Earth, so we're going to be talking about lunar tides and high tide and low tide. When the moon is next to the Earth, well, it it doesn't get that close, uh, and this is way over dramatic how close it is. I'm just trying to cover myself here because I know people are going to be attacking my representations because they aren't that good. But the point is, when the moon is like this to the Earth, this side of the Earth is going to be closer to the moon. This connects to gravity, I guess. And it's going to cause this side to be... a. Uh, more strongly attracted to the moon than this side and it's also going to cause all of the water because the water isn't as rigid to be pulled and pooled to this side of the earth causing the ocean on this side to get slightly higher than this side yes tides and then the opposite happens when the moon goes along its journey well not really the moon going around its journey, but the earth rotating and the side facing the moon is no longer facing the moon. But you have to mix that along with the moon's rotation, which knocks that a little bit off, which is why it's not always constant between days, because you also have to factor in the moon moving. But if the moon is not orbiting the earth, and the earth in general isn't spinning, how do tides work on a flat earth? Okay, so yep, that that's there's there's another one. Let's let's keep going. Okay, here we are in question number 5. And this one this one is because I know one of the current leading uh theories for flat earthers, which is that Oh god, I'm going to have to explain this well. Okay, so the North Pole exists. And the world is kind of laid out in a circle, and then around it, Antarctica is a giant ice wall that keeps in the oceans. Why have I never seen a picture of a giant ice wall holding in the oceans? What keeps it cold? And what? wait, why? Why is there a giant ice wall that no one has ever discovered? What, what about planes going by? Why would you lie about all of the plane routes just to keep this... Like, if the Earth was flat, why even hide it? What's what's the point? No, but seriously, ice walls. I, I, need, I need an answer to that because I've never heard it explained very well. <laughs> I, I've heard it as a response, but it doesn't make much sense how there's a giant wall of ice blocking off a flat Earth. From everything pouring off of it so if, if someone could clear that up that that would be great that that's that's fine 
Okay, so we've got question number six. Seasons. I would like an explanation on a flat earth how seasons work, because seasons are a byproduct of the tilt of planet earth, and although, yeah, it actually does have it right here. This tilt causes during the summer, for me, I live in North America, so during the summer, the uh, tilt pushes well, North America, closer to the sun, which doesn't actually exist at the moment, but it still has a light coming from that side, so we're going to pretend that's the sun. And then during the winter, uh, we're, <laughs> the earth still doesn't actually change, but if we do... This is going to be complicated to pull off. Because the Earth's rotating around the sun, the sun ends up... We're going to actually have to open a different simulation here for me to show this correctly because I don't want to mess this up this is this is like second grade level here so if I mess this up okay so because of the earth's tilt which we can show again here we will wait until it's favorable for summer for me at least so that's going to be about Let's wait until we're right about here. And right now, the tilt of the Earth is pushing North America closer to get more direct sunlight from the sun. And all of that is hitting directly onto it. But then during the winter, which, let's give it another half a year. Bop around to here. Oh, we went a little bit far, but that won't hurt anything. You will notice that it is not direct anymore. The Earth is tilted enough that North America is actually receiving less light and South America is receiving more light because of this tilt. The direct sunlight is still down here and that allows the equator to kind of always be a nice tropical area because it's always getting great sunlight. So yes, please explain seasons. There, there's another one. We're on a roll here. Let's go number seven next. Woo. Here we are with question number seven. And this question is going to be How does the International Space Station work? Because, like, I have personally seen it come over my house before. Um,. Uh, many people, amateur people with telescopes, take pictures of it. How? How? Just how? And if it's actually up there, how is it up there without burning constant fuel that it doesn't have? If it's not in an orbit? Yeah, okay, there, that's, that's that question. <laughs> Okay, so the next question on here now, I don't know if a lot of uh, flat earthers believe in tectonic plate movements, but considering the amount of evidence for it both in flora, uh, fossils, the shape of the continents, rocks, minerals, seafloor, uh, breaks in the seafloor that are actually constantly creating new land and eating it up, how... Those aren't really technical terms, are they? Um, <laughs> convection. But how are the continents moving on a flat Earth? Wouldn't they just hit the ice wall if they tried to go to the other side? How are these continents moving around and not, like, falling off of Earth? Yeah. Th there, there's, there's number eight. Question number nine is going to be... How are we able to so accurately simulate the possibility of a round Earth and the entire system around it? How are we able to uphold every single theory and how does every single field of science work off of the laws of physics that were produced for this reason? Everything works, even things in manufacturing, timekeeping, they all use these laws of relativity. They use, heck, we're building quantum computers now using these scientific laws, and 
we still have people saying that they aren't true, they're faked, and the Earth is flat. How does most of our modern technology work if the basis of a lot of it, our understanding of gravity and physics, is wrong? And I think number 10 is the most important question. Why? Why would you fake that? The, is there any reason? Just who would gain from making people believe that the Earth is flat when it wasn't? It, it honestly, it's kind of like me telling everyone that I own a cat named Charm when she's actually a dog. There would be no purpose in doing that, and after a while, it would become more trouble than it was worth trying to mask when she barks and stuff, which is pretty much what the Flat Earth Society is doing at this point. Whenever new evidence comes up, they have to scramble to try to come up with something on why everything is a hoax that currently exists, and at one point, is it really worth it? <laughs> at one point, when will you throw in the towel? Uh, that's going to be a secondary question off of there. When, what would be definitive proof that would make you give up your beliefs? Because I feel like if you got a flat earther at this point, because there's so much evidence, and you shot them into the sky, landed them on the moon, and then brought them back to Earth, they'd say it was all a simulation or something and you drugged them. And there's no way to debate with someone with that, like that. Jeez, going a bit crazy here. So yeah, that's going to be my 10 questions for Flat Earthers in Universe Sandbox 2. Thank you for watching the video. Leave a like and subscribe, and make sure to debate in the comments below because that's the whole purpose of this video. I don't want any harsh language or anything. I want facts, evidence, and good explanations. I do not want people linking to a million videos. You should be able to explain your point in your own words. You shouldn't have to piggyback off of other people. It took me a, well, I think this is going to be a 10 minute video to do this, so you should be able to take 10 minutes of your time, if you really believe these things, to write your opinion below. Make it understandable to people who don't already know the Flat Earth uh, system and basically we will we will debate this it will be a proper debate and i i will see you all there this is going to be fun uh yeah bye